let it take you away it take and be hopeful, hopeful, and he'll make a way. Yeah. I know it ain't easy, but that's okay. Go be hopeful. Yes, I am hopeful for today. Take this music and use it. Let it take you away and be hopeful. Welcome to the T-Price Experience. I'm your host, Tyree Price, aka T-Price, and this platform is where I interview and discuss different topics that come to my mind. Um, and today's episode is one of those things that I felt that needed to be discussed and acknowledge these women who are all about ownership, leadership, mentorship, and motivating others toward these values. Thus is why today's show is entitled Women of Leadership Ownership. If you notice, I did not say women in leadership or ownership because it's about being the leader and owner. It is of what you possess and you are not just in something that you can just get out of. These women represent some of the greatest examples of the title. I know most of these women well and have witnessed their past to greatness. So let me introduce this panel of excellence. First, I'd like to introduce a friend of mine for years. Uh, she has been, uh, I had the vision of being a multi-millionaire and in due diligence in her craft. Uh, the former corporate trainer of Certec Corporation and the business uh, director of Marketplace Missions is now uh, the business system analyst for Certec Corporations. She is the founder and CEO of her new business and relent. Relight Media Group, which is a web design and digital service firm uh, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Please welcome Ms. Katrina Mutri to the spotlight. Hello, hello everyone. Next is a young woman uh, that has wooed the fans of track and field uh, with her many accomplishments on the track and off the track. Uh, now doing it big on the collegiate coaching ranks uh, she is not only in coaching, but she is also about ownership of her name and her brand, Team Jet. While being motivated speak, a motivated speaker and mentor, Team Jet, please welcome world and world and Olympic champion sprinter, Carmelita Jetta, to the spotlight. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Now, what to say? <sighs> this next young woman, uh, she is another woman in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and she is the former professional runner, uh, former collegiate coach. And now she's an author, motivational speaker, uh, attorney and agent, founder and owner of E.O. Kelly Sports Entertainment and business law firm, ESEB. She, uh, the law firm, and she is the host of Seek Elevation and Cast. She is someone that I call every now and then <laughs> to uh, this lean uh, open ear to bounce some stuff off her. And she's the one who's going to tell it to me straight all the time and look at it at different angles. Please welcome Ella Keisha O'Kelly Esquire to the spotlight. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here amongst these amazing women. And finally, we have an amazing young woman uh, in her own right from the Wake Forest area. Uh, she is a best-selling author, mother, wife, U.S. Air Force military veteran, and a sheepreneur, as they put it. She currently is ser serving as a medical laboratory director in the field of clinical laboratory science. And she is the creator of the Become Her Speaker Series. Please welcome to the spotlight, Dr. Katrina Beerus. Hey everyone, glad to be here. Well, let's, let's kind of dive into this. Um, uh, you all are phenomenal in all of the aspects that you have done and what you have accomplished, where you are now in life. So I guess we need to really find out uh, what do you do and how does it impact others? So let's start with uh, Coach Carmelita Jetta. 
So what do I do? So um, I'm the track and field sprints coach here at the University of Southern California. And my number one goal was to impact not only women, but young men to know their worth, to know how amazing they are and to not settle. Um, I'm a believer that anything you put your mind to, you can do it. I went to a division two school, you know, everything that they said you had to do in order to be great. I did the absolute opposite. So um, not only do I speak it, I, I know it truly works. You know, um, I, I can give you the background from not being number one in the country, not going to state championships, all of those things that some coaches have taught athletes they had to be in order to be great. So um, when I'm coaching, I'm pretty much just always speaking life into people. And I, and, I, and I believe that they listen to me because I'm a walking example. Katrina mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, Moultrie. Um, hello, yes. Um, currently, I'm a, a business systems analyst with a company that I've been with for about 13 or 14 years now. Um, so basically, I um, create um, training systems. Um, I also create productivity systems. Um, previously with the same company, I was a corporate trainer. So I guess in a sense, I've always been in a position of leadership and in in a position where I needed to empower and equip others. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also own my own business, a web design um, and digital, digital services firm. I've had that company for about three years now, but I've been creating websites since about 2009. Um, And I'll give you guys the backdrop on on that and how that started a little later. Um, But I've held different leadership um, positions um, within my church, um, within nonprofit organizations. And at the end of the day, um, I just see myself as someone who wants to help and add value to anyone I come across. And I wanna help anyone around me realize and maximize their potential. Mm -hmm. Let's go with uh, attorney, uh, Ella Keisha O'Kelly Esquire. Absolutely, you just call me Ella (laughs) I'm here, but um, yeah, what do I do? Who I am is different than what do I do? Who I am, I'm an empowerment energy, period. And what I do is use all of my platforms to empower. And I love this topic because one of the things that I focus heavily on empowering individuals with is ownership, especially in communities that I identify with, communities that I grew up with, within um, underserved communities. Mm -hmm. I really, really empower individuals with ownership, but in general, handling their business and leveling up. And I do this through legal representation. I do this through online courses that I offer. And I talk about things that you can protect your brand, like you brought up with Carmelita, really about her brand. So protecting our brand, a lot of things that people don't talk to every community about, I bring to the table. I do this in the podcast, which I call EmpowerCast as well. I bring different people from the different industries that I'm in to give stories. Um, of where they started to where they're at and to level them up and books, audio, written. So I just cover all bases to empower individuals on ownership, handling their business and leveling up in our life. Yes. All right, all right, all right. And Ms. Katrina Buris. Thank you. Um, So what do I do? Uh, I do a little bit of everything, truthfully, Um, by my trade for career wise. um, As you said, I'm a clinical laboratory director in the field of public health service. Um, That is really my passion, which is serving others. Um, I count myself as a public servant, not only professionally, but personally as well, which ties into um, my other business ventures that I have explored. I have the Become Her Speaker series, which is now, as of two weeks ago, been converted to a nonprofit organization called Conquer because we focus on helping women of all ethnicities and ages conquer their fears, achieve their goals, and then give them the resources and tools to do so because a large part of leadership and ownership is making sure that you have the proper resources and that you're taught the things that you need to know and not just given them. So we focus largely upon that. 
Um, also, I love to write books. I'm a domestic violence, suicide, and childhood trauma survivor. So I use those experiences to empower other women and men, for that matter, um, on how to kind of navigate those challenges and to come out on the other side. So overall, my main purpose is to take the things that I've learned, plan them in the lives of others, and watching them succeed. That's what makes me happy, and that's what I feel like the true definition of success is. Um, so that's what I do. Okay. Well, this 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 is amazing. Um, uh, I love everything that you everyone said. Uh, so I want to dive into this now. This I'm not going to call whenever you feel like you want to um, answer the question. Go ahead. Feel free. The mic is open. Um, and this question is like you are a leader or or an owner of something valuable, um, and you kind of give us the path. Can you kind of give us the pathway of? what it took to obtain your goals uh, that you set for yourself and for um, your career aspirations? Um, well, I can start, I can break the ice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started out in undergrad at Fayetteville State University, Bronco Pride. Um, <laughs> I actually um, started my journey flunking out of school, ironically. Um, I had gotten a 1.7 GPA. I was 17 years old thereabout, um, really kind of out on my own and had to figure it out on my own. I didn't have a lot of role models, um, people that I could mop, pattern my life behind. So I really was just kind of learning as I go. Um, I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and I would have to say that my very first experience with kind of figuring out my purpose was by the example of my tutor, who was a Delta. Um, so from there, she pretty much kind of took me under her wing um, as a biology major at Fayetteville State and set the foundation that kind of um, jump-started, if you will, my goal setting and aspirations because I had no idea necessarily what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work in the lab. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to help people. I knew I didn't want to be a nurse because I'm an empath by nature. So I was way too sensitive for that because, <laughs> you know, people transitioning and stuff. I just didn't want to even do all that. So um, I went into the military and just as life would have it, I ended up being a lab tech in the military. Um, the discipline from the military, the structure, my superiors, them pouring into me and teaching me the purpose and um, the importance of being a leader and setting that example is really what catapulted me kind of back into pursuing my education, finishing my degree, and then ultimately kind of staying on the path in the, the world of clinical lab science. Um, as it relates to becoming a business owner, uh, I was a single mother for about three years, and I wanted to give my child, you know, I only had one at the time, I have two now, but I wanted to be the parent that was the example for my children, something tangible they could see, because I didn't necessarily have that, and I wanted them to see and learn about generational wealth, not just always working for someone else, so because of that, you know, I just, I, I'm a woman of faith as well, so I just did a lot of praying, soul searching, and really digging into what my purpose is and how I could accomplish that. And I just came up with the idea, wrote it down. Um, I made a vision board, you know, some years and put some different things up there to include being a business owner and obtaining my doctorate and different things like that. And I just really focused in on what it took to accomplish those things. Like, okay, I know I want to get a doctorate. What do I need to do to do that? I started surrounding myself with people that had obtained doctorates or that were in process of getting one so that I could learn the steps to do it. Um, I really love makeup. So I said, okay, I want to get a MUA certification. I started connecting with MUAs and watching them and watching YouTube videos. So I would say that a large part of my progression, I don't necessarily want to say success because again, my definition of success is different than other people, but a large part of my progression is just being teachable, being open, and then taking what I have and pouring it into others because when you do that organically, it'll come back to you. Okay. 
All right. So each of us answered the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> right. um. but, but if you don't feel like you haven't if my sign up right for you then that's cool but you know if you want to chime in chime in please absolutely i give a very condensed version because i have a very very colorful uh diverse background experience but just like katrina just whew, a lot that you when you were speaking i was like oh my gosh i hear a lot of me in there <laughs> but um <laughs> just going back first of all what i do now I realize now I've always been doing it's just had it has transformed taking different mm -hmm. platforms and look differently but it's always been the same starting with um being the first one in my immediate family to graduate from high school so really mm. empowering those around me really uh blazing that path is something I've always been doing so graduating from high school I had a scholarship to Seton Hall University. So that was going to be a huge thing, not just graduating high school, now be the first one in my immediate family to go to college. So I was really ecstatic, but I got pregnant. So I had this gap year because I had to, you know, figure out the whole ACT, SAT, things that I didn't really know about. And my family didn't know how to, you know, guide me in that direction. But I surrounded myself around a lot of individuals who were mentors, like my summer uh, club coach, high school coach, and people that just helped me. So I forfeited that Seton Hall University uh, scholarship because the coach at that time had told me once I had my child that I was going to, you know, come to the school immediately. And for me, there were several things that just didn't sit well with me on that. Um, so I know in sports, we're usually just products. I get it. But um, I really, really felt mm. that nah, I'm just going to take a chance on this one and walk away from that and figure that out, out. And I had a whole lot of figuring out to do. I ended up, you know, getting out, having my own place, having this newborn child. And I went to the college in my hometown and the coach didn't have any scholarship money, but did put me in contact with someone with a program called EOP, um, Education Opportunity Program for those who did okay um, academically, but are struggling financially. And I sat with board of directors mm. and um, convinced them why they should give this young lady a chance with a child, um, single mother. And I did. And I was a walk-on at the University of Albany track team, broke hey. every, record, every record in my event but I felt I wanted more. Um, that's just the mindset to keep expanding. And I started reaching out to several colleges, got um, uh, responses back, end up at University of South Carolina, where I finished off my collegiate uh, track career, broke records there, Yay. did great things as SEC. And that just started opening my mind. The sports thing started opening my mind more so business side. Even when I competed mm -hmm. professionally, training and competing, but I was so attracted to the business side. I was helping training partners um, with a lot of different business things. I eventually let go of all the agents I was dealing with and was handling my own uh, business transactions. And it really just had attraction to that. But um, after that, I just put a, a, a stop to that, decided to go back to college and uh, got my master's degree. Then law school, this is where the turn where life snatches you sometime and you think you have a plan. I went to law school thinking that I was going to get my Juris Doctor. I was not planning on practicing. Being a lawyer was not the thing. I want to just get my Juris Doctorate, learn local, state, and federal laws, and excel in HR because I had did HR. That was my goal. Got into law school. First year, I was going to drop out because I was older, not a non-traditional student. I was 30-something years old. And I was like, why did I do this? You know, I'm being hazed. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to survive. But <laughs> I made it through the first semester. I said, just get up each day, one step at a time. Just, just move. That's right. And if you, if you don't want to do this after the first semester, don't. But I made it through the first semester, seen a huge turnaround. And I realized why I was in law school. It wasn't for HR. It was for me to go back home to my family and sports and entertainment empowered on a whole different level to help them in a way that I was already helping them, but in a way where I could knock down more doors. And so my path has been continuing to go that way since then. Mm. I love it. Yes, honey. Mm. <laughs> um, I guess I'll jump in next. Uh, for me, it all started with um, a vision. 
I was very young, um, about nine years old, um, when I knew that I would be a millionaire, if not a billionaire. Um, I would hey. draw. I would draw pictures of the compound that I wanted to live on. Um, I still have these pictures um, to date. Um, I also play sports. I play oh, basketball. Me. I ran track. And most kids my age, they want to make it to the NBA. The WNBA didn't exist back then for girls. Um, and while others wanted to make it to the NBA, I wanted to own the basketball team. So I knew at a very young age that I wanted to be wealthy. I wanted to be um, in a position of influence when it came to the business world. I knew these things, even though my nine-year-old mind didn't have the capacity to really understand what that came with. Um, I, I played sports all throughout high school. I went to um, Clemson University on a track scholarship. Um, I wanted to be an architect. That is what I wanted to be my whole life. I started off with architecture at Clemson for my first three years. Um, unfortunately, I was forced to change my major. Um, pretty much this is what time practice is. Your labs are doing practice time, so you have to change another major. I could not afford to go to Clemson University on my own, so I changed my major. Coming out of um, Clemson, I was a sport management major nothing I really ever desired to do. So I'm out of college. I have this degree that I do not want to use. Um, mm. I was fortunate that God opened up a door with the company that I was able to progress through very quickly. I moved up the ladder. It's the same company that I'm still with to this day. Um, how I got to owning a digital services and web design firm, because I have no background in this whatsoever. I was um, a part of a ministry that had a nonprofit organization. Um, the pastor of this church has a very large vision. He needed eight websites. We didn't have the resources to get eight websites completed. So I said, fine, I'll figure out how to get these built. Eight websites? Eight websites. <laughs> he, had eight, eight, he had eight different visions, a, a school, um, the nonprofit. Yeah, he, he, he needed, he had a high demand. Um, wow. So I said, you know what? I'm going to find a solution for this. I taught myself how to build a website. I taught myself wow. the HTML. Um, and, and it was over the course of, you know, a couple of years. It's not something that happened overnight. But because that demand was there and I answered the call, it opened up an entire opportunity that I never thought would be there. I never thought I would own a web design firm. I always knew that I would be in business, just never knew quite what business I would be in. Um, so for me, it starts with the vision. I saw where I wanted to be and I just took the, the, the different steps to get there. And that's the same, mm -hmm. that's my model for anything, for anything. Um, outside of that, I do have a couple of other businesses that I didn't touch on, but the, the one that I'm working on right now is an investment firm. I see where I want to be the, with, with this investment firm. I want to break barriers. I want to hit milestones that have never been hit before. So I go to the future. I see where I want to be. I come mm -hmm. back and I implement a plan to get there. Um, so yeah. that's kind of how, how I how I started and how I got to where I am now. I feel like honestly, I'm I'm just literally at the beginning of my journey. Um, but uh, you know, I feel like as a leader, as long as you're always willing to solve a problem, as long as you're always willing to provide a solution, you're always going to be in demand. Right? Yes, always in demand. I love it, Katrina. Come on, beautiful. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'll answer the question as well. Um, I mean, I could talk all day about just the levels that I've right. gone through from high school to college. And, and I'll just fast forward it a little bit um, to, you know, of course, everybody knows me as being an Olympic champion, world champion. But then once I decided I wanted to coach, it was kind of, it was like starting from scratch, right? You know, because now I'm in a new 
arena to where I have to prove myself. You know, it's it's not mm-hmm. the same me running on the track. Now, can she coach? Can she do this? And so many mm-hmm. times some people, they don't like to take two steps back to take five steps forward. Um, mm-hmm. And so the number one thing I did was I did take a, a few steps back. You know, who would think the fastest woman alive at the time would have went to a mid-major school to coach? Um, and it was a, a women's only program and it was a very small program, but I knew I had to put my foot in the door. And, and I tell people that all the time, like, don't look at where you have to start at. You got to think about where you're trying to go. And if you're not willing to step back to get there, it's never going to happen. So I went to this mm-hmm. um, mid-major school and I knew I was going to be there for two years. And I told them, I said, well, I need to get my master's while I'm here. And um, I need you guys to pay for it. And so I got my master's, professional studies, sports management, while I was at Missouri State University. And then I did some amazing things there. And I I spent another year at another school, which was in the SEC, which was a a step higher. And then all of a sudden, okay, I guess I guess she can coach. I guess she is, you know, pretty, pretty good. And then I get another job in the Pac-12 at USC. And so You know, my journey of being this amazing athlete, but then having to prove myself all over again um, was challenging because then you're second guessing yourself and and you're saying, well, I've been great and everybody's been putting me on this pedestal. But now I have to fight to get back to this pedestal. And and for three years, that's pretty much what I had to do. And I'm still doing that. You know, I still have to um, show the world, you know, what I could do on the coaching coaching side. So I'm just going to say my my struggle and my battle these last four years have just been making sure I don't doubt myself. Just um, making sure that every step I take is in the direction of the greatness that I want to go to and being okay with having to pause or take a step back in order to get there. Um, My motto is brick by brick. And if you lay your bricks down and you have your foundation, then your, your house will never fall down. Right. Um, and so that's what I'm doing in this coaching world right now is I'm building my bricks. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I definitely nice. want to um, chime in with that and yeah. just say to you that you are already great. Like <laughs> you don't have to be achieving any greatness. The fact that you have so much humility to be able yes. to say, Hey, I was willing to take a step back and the acknowledging that I'm still working that speaks volumes, not only of you as a person, but your character, your values. And I think that those that you coach are blessed and privileged to have a leader as humble and as hardworking and as goal-oriented as you, because you just inspire me. And I just met you like, I wish yeah, I ran your school. <laughs> right. And you're an athlete in life. That's what it sounded like to me. The same thing, like when you yes. step out there on the track and you transition from, like you said, from one school to the other and different levels and all that it. stuff. You're doing that in life. You're an athlete in life. You got this. You already mm-hmm. know. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, I, I believe that every successful person is an athlete because yes. when, when you set everything up, it's structured like an athlete, right? You're Absolutely. disciplined, you sacrifice, you, you have to have your life in a certain lane in order to get the job done. So in my eye, everybody that's successful they might not be an athlete physically, but mentally you are one because there's no way for you to get the things done that you want done if you didn't have the mindset of being the best. And as an athlete, we know what that takes. That takes, you know, sacrifice. That takes motivation. That takes so yes. many things. So if, if you're a successful, you are an athlete. I hadn't even thought about that. Like that is so dope. Like that makes a lot of sense. So maybe I can take that and then, you know, me and my husband having conversations about sports, I could slip that in there. And yes. Like, right. I'm talking about. <laughs> like, listen, I'm an athlete in life. No, but like I'm an athlete. athlete, athlete. athlete. What are you talking about? Right. I'm an athlete in life. That's, the, that's the toughest sport to play. It is. Absolutely. Hands down. Hey, the life be life in. Yes. <laughs> but in the piggyback on that life aspect, uh, through, through the the struggles that long there's going to be struggles along the way. Everybody has, has seen that, and you, you you kind of touched on those things. How did you get to where you are not entrapped with uh, the pressures from within, and then the pressures from the exterior coming in to stop not to stop you from 
being where you are or where you're trying to go. With the pressures? Pressures? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for me to focus on, I focus on the within. Mm -hmm. to, to answer your question, which you started with. I focus on the within, then the outside doesn't even matter, right? So when I change my within, it changes your whole perception. It changes how you see things, how you deal with things. So I always focus on my within. Um, previously, you know, early on, early, early on, it was always on the outside and you try to change and adapt and how do you adjust to that? But then as those change and adjust, you're constantly finding yourself all over the place. But mm -hmm. with that alignment inside, no matter what changes out there, that, that core thing that I have within and making sure I always revisit that always levels out everything externally for me. Yeah, that's I, I think I would say that, you know, prefer, pressure is a privilege, right? Um, much is given, much is expected. And I am a, a person that I like the pressure. I enjoy the pressure. It feeds me. Um, and maybe that's a part of my being a world champion, being a gold medalist, being an Olympian, that I love it. I, I invite it um, because I'm just... I, I'm a confident, very confident person. And so I react different to the pressure. Um, it's something that I actually enjoy. <laughs> mm. um, I, I enjoy the naysayers. I enjoy the doubters because I know how great I am. So when I do what I already knew I was going to do, it just really makes me enjoy the process of getting there. So I'm a, I'm a person that feeds off of the pressure. Um, I feel like if I don't have pressure, I don't know, I might get a little relaxed. And so when I have the pressure and I know it's there, it, it fuels me and, and um, it just, I invite it. And I think I'm a combination of both of them. Um, I am just now, you know, even though I'm coming up on 41 years, 41 trips around the sun, um, I am just now kind of rediscovering, if you will, my me within and how to um, really tap into her so that I can navigate some of life's challenges. Um, being Going through the whole uh, process of being a suicide survivor and just that whole ordeal in itself really forced me to dig deeper than I probably really wanted to go um, because I didn't have anybody to necessarily pull me out, right? So it's like, okay, you got two options. Either you're going to pull yourself out or you're going to put yourself under. So which one is it? You know that you have these aspirations, which speaks to the, the drive about the pressure and like inviting it and knowing what you're capable of. Like while I was in that situation, I knew what I was capable of. I knew what I had accomplished so far, but because I couldn't see what lied ahead, I lost focus of what I already knew, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. So I just have, even now, it's a daily, a daily task, like to get up and just be intentional about focusing on the things that I can control, not worrying about the things I can't, and pretty much, you know, embracing the little hateration thing that goes on because anybody that's doing something right is going to have somebody that says they're doing something wrong. And are you going to let that thing that they say you're doing wrong deter you, discourage you, and make you go down in the dump? Are you going to take what they say you're doing wrong and say, eh, 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 let me show you why it's right. And while you're talking about me, really, you should be focusing on what you got going on because the time you're spending talking about me is time you're taking away from what you really could be accomplishing. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, let me connect you with some resources to kind of get you back on track because mm -hmm. apparently you don't have enough to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I'm just a mixture of, of both, you know, just rediscovering every day, being intentional, and then also inviting the pressure. You know, I shared with my husband, I, gra I just graduated last May um, from my doctoral program, right? And so I was like, what am I gonna do now? Like, I don't have any papers. <laughs> I don't have any deadlines. I don't have any discussion questions. So then I started researching certification. And he's like, what are you doing? I was like, well, oh, gosh, yeah. you know, I need another certification because this is gonna work with the business if I learn this part. So 
I just, you know, I think I'm just a mixture of all of it, really. Um, and I would agree with you, Katrina. I think I'm, I'm more of a mixture as well. Um, I'm, I'm kind of on that same journey as you, um, kind of mm -hmm. rediscovering uh, my true self. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, just trying to have everything align up on the inside, taking control of my thinking, being intentional uh, about being positive every day, mm -hmm. and my thoughts, my actions, my decisions, everything that I do. I needed to align with where I'm going in life. Um, right. But um, I also um, agree with Carmeletta. Also, I love pressure. I feel like I perform my best under pressure. Yes. Um, and I love, <laughs> I love challenges. Um, honestly, I get bored very quickly. If I'm not challenged, oh my gosh, like I will move to the next, like, ASAP. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I definitely think um, it, it's a combination of both. And I think um, having that balance is a lovely thing. Having that um, internal soundness and calmness, but also when things kind of ramp up, hey, I'm ready too. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Say, um, say, let's go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, love it. So now, okay, this this this, this is going to dive into you uh, in a little bit more. Um, so, what does a woman of leadership, woman of ownership, look like to you as you describe yourself? Humble, humility to me is the bridge that gets you to where you're going, because humility puts you in so many different arenas, right? Because humility means people you're approachable, people don't mind coming to you. And in leadership roles, ownership roles, you wanna be a person that's approachable. You wanna be a person that if someone has a question about what you're doing, that they don't have to hesitate and be like, uh, can I ask her, is she reachable? So humility is very important. It opens the door to so many different opportunities and it connects you to people. To me, real leadership is about connecting to people, not necessarily overseeing people. Um, like people sometimes, especially in my field, they're like, oh, you're elected. like my staff, for example. They see me coming, they could be having a good time. I walk in, it's like a church mouth. And I'm like, what is happening? Why are y'all so quiet all of a sudden? I mean, you walked in the lab. Okay, I got legs. That means I can walk back out. That don't mean y'all got to change. What you're doing, just because I walk in, I put my pants on one leg at a time this morning, just like you did. Like, what's going on? What y'all doing this weekend? You know, so I think that in order to be an effective leader, because you can be a leader, right, and be good at what you're doing, but not be effective. People don't want to listen to you. People don't respect you. People don't really value what you have to say. Um, but if you're a good leader, I think for me, humility is what I always lead with. Like, you know, I don't tell people that um, I have a doctor. To me, I'm still Katrina. The doctor was just a means to an end to expand my skill set to make me better in my craft. That's it. I, could, I mean, you know, extra money is nice, all that. But really, I just needed to be better in my craft because I want to be able to be an example to the people that are coming behind me. Um, so for me, humility, number one thing. And um, just to kind of um, piggyback off of what you were saying, um, I, I think it's about service also, um, which stems from that level of humility. And also, like you were saying, you, you know, you don't worry about the title. That's being mm -hmm. a true leader because leadership isn't about titles. It's really not about position. You could have the title and position and not be a true leader or That's an effective right. leader. Um, it's definitely about serving others it's about empowering others. It's about inspiring others. Um, as a leader, you should be able to challenge um, that individual at their level of greatness. You should be mm -hmm. able to challenge them to be their best. You should be able mm -hmm. to, to, to inspire them to be great. All of those things are about leadership. Um, and um, even more than doing, it's really about becoming. It's about who you are. Leadership should be something that you do by example. Um, mm -hmm. I, I believe that the foundation of leadership is character. 
Um, mm. you, you have to have that. You have to have that in order to lead. And um, uh, unfortunately, um, we are in a, over, um, a society that's overmanaged and underled. There's a lot of yes. managers out here, definitely, but there, there's very few true leaders because uh, a lot of times leaders can be intimidated when they're leading someone who has the potential to be better than them. And yes. In, instead of um, instead of having that fear, you should embrace it because that speaks to your leadership. If whoever mm-hmm. I'm mentoring isn't going to be 10 times better than me, I'm not doing my job right as a leader. Exactly. So I think at the end of the day, it's all about service to humanity. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely agree. I, I agree with what you both said, humility and, and service. But I would have, I'm going to have to add confidence with that, too, because mm-hmm. it's very hard to follow an insecure person. It's very hard to mm-hmm. follow someone that you can't trust. It's very hard to be led by someone that you're afraid where you're going, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel a, tr- a, a leader brings confidence to the room to where whomever they're working with feel a little taller when that person walks in the room, feels a little stronger when that person walks in the room. So when I think of a leader, I think of someone that's extremely confident, not arrogant, it's a big difference, but um, extremely confident to where when that leader walks in the room, whomever works under them automatically feels empowered because they know who's guiding them. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely all they said. I mean, they covered it. I want to just go back to the humility real quickly, though, because especially if there's young ladies listening to that word has been thrown out before and it has been, you know, rejected. Um, humility doesn't mean passiveness. And That's right. as a person who has to deal with words on a daily basis, words are important to understand how you're receiving it with what they mean. Um, and how somebody else is actually receiving it. So hum- humility is not passiveness at all. Um, that humbleness doesn't mean you allow someone to take advantage of you. That means That's right. that you allow whatever gifts you have to speak for themselves and you follow mm. in there through that. And humility is not just for outside people, it's for yourself who look mm-hmm. in the mirror at yourself. Um, it mm-hmm. allows us to be a more forgiving for to ourselves, more patient um, to ourselves. So humility is a mm-hmm. big one. I just wanted to revisit and not skim over that um, as a leader, um, ownership, anything you're de- doing, you need humility. And I would That's like right. to add, of course, confidence. Mm-hmm. I mean, what else? I mean, you're leading. That means you're going to have to be a leader. There have to be people following. Yes. And mm-hmm. to have anyone following, <laughs> you have to exude um, that confidence. It's just natural. It's a natural mm-hmm. thing. And that's why I truly believe we need resilience um, to perseverance because mm-hmm. that leading is a calling that snatches you. And it mm-hmm. can, sometimes when you want to walk away, mm. it can have you locked in a situation that, no, nope, yes. you need to be there. So as a leader, um, we need that perseverance, um, that resiliency. We need to be students and teachers. Oh, I love it. I love it, love it, love y'all it. Y'all better drop them gems. <laughs> oh, y'all, dropping them. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> killing it. We got some uh, some pastors on here, I guess now too, because preachers <laughs> were. <laughs> uh, well, you know, through uh, I've heard this come across a, lo- a couple of times on, on, as you were speaking, um, and it was it leads right into another question I had. So y'all right on point for what I'm what I'm going towards. Um, in order to be where you are, you, you know, you've come across some some good mentors, and you have some 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 bad mentors there. So what would you tell uh, other women who are seeking or, or on the verge of obtaining leadership or, or ownership about selecting their right mentors and what could, could or should they look like? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> your mentors? I'm, I'm gonna, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no. I'm going to say that everyone that you pick is going to help you in some way. Um, if you do pick a mentor that you, you, you then think that that wasn't the right mentor for you, guess what? You learned a lot, right? You learned what not mm-hmm. to do. 
you learned how you didn't want to treat people. You're going to learn from every mentor, good and bad. And, and, and I just with, just with the workplace, you're going to learn from every boss, good and bad, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's mm -hmm. just about making sure that you're learning as you're going through the process. Each mentor is put in place for a certain reason. And, right. um, and sometimes that one mentor was put in place to teach you what not to do. And another mentor is put in place to build you and help you grow. So you're going to learn from whomever you pick. Um, I would say that you should go off of your gut with a lot of people, you know, and, mm -hmm. and your first impression. I'm, hu I'm very big on first impression. I know if I like you from the first hello. I know from your body language. I know if I want to surround myself with you. Or I know if you're someone that I need to just learn what I need to learn from so I can go about my merry way. So mm -hmm. when you're picking mentors, you don't look at a certain person to pick them. You look at the words that they use when they speak. And then mm -hmm. you can decide which one is going to be best for you, but you're going to learn something from every mentor you have. There's no um, cookie cutter sheet on a good mentor or a bad mentor. You're going to learn as you go through the process with them. Definitely. Definitely. I definitely would piggyback on that. Um, actually, you took the words right out of my mouth and that just goes to show how, you know, great minds think alike um, because <laughs> we're all interconnected and vibing off each other. I just love the conversation. Um, I would say for me, when it comes to picking mentors, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to make the controversial statement that is probably kind of un un unorthodox, but I haven't had good opportunities with mentors. Um, I have come up against a lot of opposition, especially in the realm of not only clinical laboratory science, but women's empowerment in general. Um, what I have experienced is to um, Carmelita's point is that I've learned what not to do and how not to be and how to be a good mentor because I've had such poor examples. Um, I have come across women you know, that portray hey, I'm available, I'm a resource and things like that. And then when you reach out to them, they've even either given you the wrong number, they either ghost you on social media or wherever, they don't email you back, they say, hey, I can do this. And then when it's time, like, hey, you know, are you still open to assisting? It's cricket, cricket. So mm -hmm. um, I would definitely agree that the way that I am and how I present myself to others and make myself available is a direct reflection of what I haven't had. And as I go forth, you know, in my journey, in my purpose, that is my sole foundational principle is to be the light that I didn't have in the dark. That's mm -hmm. what I want to do. That's who I want to be. That's how I'm setting myself up. And even when it's hard, even when it's not easy, even when I get discouraged, I have to remember, I want to be the light to somebody else's darkness. I don't care what, I don't care if it's a, a little crack, a little crack. I'm going to be the little crack of light mm -hmm. and we're going to keep it moving. Um, so I definitely agree that, you know, also for me, mentorship is organic, in my opinion. I don't think you should necessarily look like, oh, let me see this person. Let me connect with them. It's not always meant. You know, even though somebody may be a good mentor, it may not be in the universe for you to be connected to that person because while they may be a good mentor, they might not be a good mentor for you and what you're trying to do. Like most people might say, oh, um, I'm going to pick on Katrina. Oh, she's got a web design company. I want to be a web designer. Well, what kind of web designer do you want to be? Do you want to be a web designer for hair? Do you want to be a web designer for nails? Do you want to be a web designer for IT? You have to figure out if what she's doing aligns with what you want to do. And that takes time and that takes research and that's a process. And a lot of times the younger generation, you know, no slight to my millennials because I think I'm on the cusp of being a millennial. They want these <laughs> microwave solutions. Yes. They want to just stick it in there and it come out and it's done. I'm from the old school where you got to bake that thing. You got to soak the beans, <laughs> let the dead, you know, the bad ones rise up, pick them out. You know, it's a process and you just have to be patient. And I would say mentorship 
comes in so many different ways. Again, when we talk mm-hmm. about words. So first of all, mentorship can come from someone, you read a book, they've been mentoring. They don't even know they're your mentor. You can find your mentors in whatever path, field, or whatever you have going on that have been there, done that, and whatever, and studied that person. That is a mentor. Mm-hmm. It can also mm. come in ways that you least suspect. My G baby, and yes, I said my grandbaby. My uh-huh. baby. Yes. <laughs> You're looking good over there. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. My G baby is my mentor. She mentors me on keeping that that innocence, that childlike mind, that 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 mindset that we had to know that we can be a millionaire, to know that we can accomplish these other things. That the world comes in and put all this noise in your head that you have to go back to that purity. And every time I watch her and I see her and watch how she just reacts and handle things, it reminds me that's exactly the gifts that we have in order to accelerate in life period. So she mentors us. Then you have those um, mentors that you may find for just different phases in your life, different things Mm -hmm. you want in your life. It may not be this one person that's mentoring you. You have, we're, we're layered. We're layered. Mm -hmm. So we may find different people to get different things from. Um, And how, when we're looking at outside people, how do you measure if you have someone that is right? Or, and I put that in quotes, is it someone that is having you do it their way? Or is it someone that's assisting you, guiding you, GPSing you in the Mm -hmm. way that was put in you? And I mm-hmm. learned that. It reminds me of what Katrina said earlier about, you know, wanting to accomplish things so your kids don't. And that was my, one of my main drives. If you remember, I said I was pregnant with my daughter and I knew everything from there was all for her, 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 her. Mm-hmm. That was my mindset. I'm doing this for her. But as she come of age and this happens with kids, you, you think you're doing it for one thing and they're going to appreciate it this way, but they can always see it totally differently. Than what you right. But I didn't have this. I didn't have that. So what one thing life have taught me is that I'm not going to put someone else's, my thing on someone else. I need to learn yours, your unique gift, because if I'm pushing mm. on you, what I want you to do, I'm quieting and suppressing what it is that you're supposed to do. So as parents, mm. I don't do that as the mentor, your mm-hmm. mentor should be doing it. They should just be guiding you and p- help pushing you forward to be in bring forth whatever uniqueness that you have. That's right. Giving you the resources. That's it. Giving you the resources. If you give a man a fish, he'll what? Eat for a day. If you teach him how to fish, he'll what? Never go hungry. Never go hungry. I love it. (laughs) Cool, cool, cool. Well, you know, um, some of you uh, and and even out there, uh, those who are watching, they have families, you know, they have, and some of you have already said it, the kids, the significant other, the live-in per- person, you know, how do you manage those factors uh, while being uh, the slayer that you are um, and proving that to be? Um, how do you manage those factors to make sure that those entities don't construct or construe what you're trying to accomplish and and and, and being that leader because you know there's some some women out there may look at it as like uh, I'm, I'm use this word terminology again i'm the only male on here so the excuse situation of why they are not successful or not being leaders or not being of ownership so how do you, you know, a lot of you have gone through some stuff. So how, how do you combat those, those things and, and giving words of wisdom to these young women coming along? Um, I, I guess um, I really can't speak for everyone because everybody's situation is definitely um, totally unique. Um, I am a single mother. I have a 15-year-old. Um, and I will say for me, it does take a village uh, because I, I work a full-time job. I run a business. Um, I do several other things. And uh, of course, I have the responsibility of, 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 of um, raising a child. So it does take a village. Um, but I, um, time management, I guess, for me, it is. it's time management. Um, I have to plan my days out very well. Um, I have to plan a lot of things around him and his schedule. He's a student athlete. 
um, just started mm-hmm. high school. So he, he has a crazy schedule. He plays on two basketball teams and runs track. So it's wow. like having three kids in one right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but, but time management um, is the main thing. Uh, and also making sure that when I am with my son, when I am with my family, that I am present. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not dealing with business. I'm not doing, cause I've, I've had a very bad habit of doing that, thinking that I can multitask. Okay. I'm, I'm with you. Let me handle this, 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 this. this. And I, I really had to, um, just kind of slow down and learn that I need to give attention. to whatever I'm doing that deserves 100% of my focus, Um, so I try to kind of compartmentalize. That's where I am at right now as a business owner. I I try to keep everything in in its place. Um, and it does, it, 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 it takes a a lot of hard work. Um, but like I said, I do have, um, a village. I have my mother, I have my sisters, they all pitch in when they can. Um, and I'm also fortunate that everything I do is done from home. So I've been blessed to where I can take him to school every day. I can pick him up. Um, if he's out for the summer, I'm here with him. Um, so that's how I'm able to do it. And um, I, I kind of try to um, make it to where even with my job, I work from home. Um, I've been working from home since about 2012, and that that was one of my stipulations when he started to get a little older. Hey, um, can we figure out, you know, how I can start spending a little more time at home um, as well as in the office? So I started 50 percent at home, 50 percent in the office, and I was able to kind of negotiate to where I was 100 percent home. So um, just trying to do everything that I can do in my power to juggle all of these things to where I can be effective in every role that I play. And I will also say, first of all, the village, I mean, that's for sure, like period. Um, That's what it takes. Communication solves so many of the problems that we have. Effective communication, because you have to understand again, what you're saying, what you're receiving, Talk to your family. I would say the, the, the issue we run into is that we're given a narrative of what whatever is supposed to look like, marriage, being a mom, being a dad. And a lot of times we're looking to aspire to those narratives where it's, it's different. It's based on your situation and your situation is sitting down and having those conversations with your family. I remember when I started law school, the one thing, the narrative they pushed to us was law school's your mistress. You're going to have to let everything go. You, this is what you're going to put your time into. And I bought into that narrative. That first semester, <clears throat> nope, automatically saying to myself, this is law school supposed to be my mistress. I'm supposed to do it this way. I'm supposed to, because you hear that. And all of a sudden the real stuff kick in. That's why a lot of people are not working out in law school when they could, they could actually do it. So sitting down, talking with my husband, talking with my kids, just talking about things Mm -hmm. and them understanding, not me just hearing their wishes, but understanding and respecting me too. So all of us just having respect across the board, because at the end of the day, those are all titles, right? Those Mm -hmm. are all identifiers for people, but I'm still a human. I'm still me. And so Mm -hmm. everybody respecting that once we got to that level and that communication, then everything else, we were all able to just figure it out. And I definitely would concur um, with both of what my sisters have said about it taking a village. Um, Cause it, it definitely does. Nobody can exist in this world alone and nobody can do it alone. Nobody can carry every single thing, right? Um, but something that I started doing um, a few years ago that has worked for me and you know maybe those watching it may work for you um and even some of my ladies here i don't know if you have thought about doing this or if you currently do it um but i started being very intentional about incorporating my kids into my dreams and visions things that i was doing things like you know if i had a photo shoot for branding i might take my oldest along and say hey come with mom and he's like what you doing like we're going to a photo shoot and he, oh, and that sparks conversation, right? And that gets him interested on, oh, well, mommy, what are you doing a photo shoot for? I'm like, well, mommy's doing a branding shoot. Well, what is branding? 
And then I have the opportunity to explain to him what branding is. And then he says, well, mom, well, what are you doing that for? And I say, well, it's for mommy's business. Well, is it your books or is it your speaking thing? You know, and then that opens the dialogue, A, for him to learn more about business, different aspects of business, and B, to also learn more about his mother and for me to have an opportunity to learn more about him and his interests. Because when he's talking to me about my interests and that sparks in him, well, mommy, if you can be an author, I could be an NBA player, can't I? You sure can, whatever you want to do. How are you going to be an NBA player? Well, I have to go to practice. I got to be good at basketball. I got to make the ball go in the hoop. You got to do all, you right. You got to do all of that. But guess what, son? You have to make good grades too because basketball players don't make bad grades. You need to go to school because in order to play basketball, you need to go to somebody's college or somebody's high school or something. So um, just incorporating, you know, my kids into what I'm doing um, helps me to balance too because they're able to come with me. Sometimes they can't, but um, that's one thing I do. And then I'm also very intentional. We have mommy son date night once a week. Once a week, we have an hour and a half that is just the three of us and we spend time together, whether that's eating, whether that's walking around TJ Maxx, whether that's riding just somewhere to get ice cream. Um, I'm very intentional about making that time to connect with them. And then also with my husband as well, um, making time to connect with him, even if it's watching our favorite show for 30 minutes, just, you know, like Katrina said, just being intentional about carving out that time and not letting it be interrupted. I would definitely agree with what everyone's saying. And, and like Katrina said, everybody's situation is different. Um, so there's no um, one way to get things done. I think I would add that um, being okay with asking for help. You know, many times people are so prideful, right? And mm -hmm. they just want to try to do everything on their own. But, you know, nothing can really be done on your own. You're, something's mm -hmm. going to burn out. Something's going to give. Something's going to fall through the crack. So I would definitely say be okay with asking for help. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be what I am today if I didn't ask for help. Um, it's definitely something that, you know, my family did for me. I grew up with a, um, a mother that had a severe drug problem and I was 24 years old and I took my little sister that was five and mm -hmm. I did all of that by myself and my dad mm -hmm. and my stepmom stepped in and played grandparents but um, I asked for help, I needed help. And she ended up graduating from Clark Atlanta. She's done some amazing things. So I couldn't have done that by myself. And you wouldn't have known mm -hmm. I was doing that while I was running track or I was doing all these amazing things. But like Katrina said, I was very good with scheduling. So you would probably not know that I went to every track meet she had, every cheerleading, things wow. she had for Pop Warner. Oh my Every God. I was there when she graduated from the eighth grade. I missed a meet and got a reduction from my contract because I was going to that graduation. So, so yes, it's, it, it's about knowing what's important too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people forget the importance. I had an opportunity where I could have wrote a book, but then with writing that book, would I have destroyed her in the process because she wasn't old enough to understand the book right. and I decided not to write the book because it, it she's she was bigger than what my PR team wanted to create and this is in 2012 when I won all these medals I said no I'm not doing that I said because she's still in high school they're going to eat her alive that's right <laughs> you yeah. know and, and 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 people are cruel and so mm -hmm. um, I would just say remember what's important many times people get caught up in money and and clothes and shoes and the <clears throat> highlight of things, but please never forget the the little person that 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 needs you, that's looking up to you. Like don't yes. don't sell, don't sell out and ruin a relationship that um, will take you one minute to ruin. You know, mm -hmm. don't don't ruin a relationship. So I would definitely say, um, ask for help. And um, always remember what's important. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'm going to uh, open the floor up uh, to you, distinctive uh, women of distinction. Um, 
as I'm the only man asking questions here and, and, and the ladies out there really don't want to hear me ask some questions. So as we get ready to close, you know, you know, for the women out there who want to hear what questions that you may have for the others on this panel, um, some things that might be inspiring for the leadership and ownership and, and what you've heard. And, you know, you might have some other things that you want to dialogue about. The floor is open to for you to ask uh, each other questions. So I have a question. Um, my question is for Carmelita. So being um, an Olympian, a gold medalist, first of all, I'm very humbled to even be in your presence of, of such greatness. Um, and just your spirit in itself is, is very humble and very welcoming. And um, even just jumping on the call, like before I even knew all of your accolades, your, your spirit just was jumping through the phone. Um, so my question is to you is, if you had to um, tell another young lady or even myself that, you know, is aspiring to do something that seems unattainable, what would you tell us? Like, what, what do you think would be one of the keys that we could put in our toolbox to motivate us to keep going when it seems like it's the hardest? Oh, gosh, what would I tell you? Because, boy, did I have some hard moments in time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a believer of writing everything down. Mm -hmm. I write everything that I want down and I write it on a real piece of paper so I can actually cross mm -hmm. it off. And mm -hmm. so the number one thing I would tell you is you can't write anything down that you don't actually believe. It has to be something that you know that you can do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a believer of writing things down that you have to jump up to grab opposed to just getting on your tippy toes and grabbing it. It has to be yes. something that's going to cause you to step out of your comfort zone. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. num number one advice that I would always give is it's, it's easy to, to, to go with the crowd. It's hard to go by yourself and make the crowd come and follow you. So you ain't let's, never lie. <laughs> let's, let's not be a follower. Let's, let's be okay with being by ourselves until everyone else is okay with understanding how amazing you are. Yes. I love it. You, you said you're recording this? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to need to run that back. I'm going to need to run that back so I can remind myself, add it to my affirmation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I could talk all day. I'm just trying to be <laughs> modest and give other people a chance to talk because I could ask all kinds of questions because I'm just intrigued by everybody. I'm, you know, <laughs> Me but, too. Me too. But hey, listen. Well, you know what? I have a, I have a question. Um, I guess I would ask, um, uh, my question would be just across the board. Anybody can answer it. Um, at what point did you want to stop? And what did what did you... What, what was the thing that clicked? You know how we all have that one thing that clicked that was like, oh no, I'm about to do this. This is about to go down. Um, what made, what clicked in you that one day that changed the narrative? Um, I could definitely speak to that. I was in grad school, um, doing my undergrad, my, um, my grad, my master's degree in criminal justice um, with a concentration in forensics. And um, my daughter passed away. Um, I had a daughter, she was stillborn. And at that moment, I stopped. So that answers the first part of your question. That was the moment when I stopped because um, she passed away, their relationship dissolved. It was very traumatic, the experience. Um, I had just relocated to the Raleigh area um, with her father. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any friends here. I didn't have a church here. My family was an hour and a half away. I um, mean, really I only had my father because I don't have you know siblings and things like that. And so when that happened, literally my life stopped. Um, that was around the same time frame of the suicide attempt and things like that um what clicked for me is it took a while um it was much of a journey but I distinctly remember um the third so my suicide attempt was threefold so I tried three days in a row the first two days somebody found me both days and I was like you know what bump this I'm not going out no more because every time I go out and I try this somebody finds me 
So the first day they found me slumped over at a bar. The second day they found me slumped over in my car. And then the third day I said, you know what? I'm not even going out. I'm just going to lock myself in the house. So I did. Um, and, you know, I attempted to overdose, you know, I had gone and got a big old bottle of Sutter home wine. And um, I had, you know, the medications and things that the provider had given me to kind of cope with the anxiety and the depression and all of the things that came with, you know, losing a child. And I was just like, you know what, I'm done. You know, you done took my child, you done took my man. I can't focus at school. He's telling me to get out. I don't have anywhere to go. I don't have a job because I did not have a job at the time because I had just moved here. And I was like, I'm done. So that evening, um, you know, as I started the process, you know, I made a couple calls, different things like that. And um, one of my good, good, good college friends um, was one of the second to the last people I called. And I told him what I had done. I said, hey, I'm transitioning. Um, I wanted to let you know, here's the where you need to find the important information that I that you'll need to give to my dad or whatever. This is where you need to find it. And he tricked me and was like, well, listen, um, can I have my homeboy just come check on you real quick? Because he was in Fayetteville. And I was like, sure, ain't nothing he can do, but you can send him or whatever. So long story short, fast forward, and he actually had called the EMS to come. EMS comes and they're like, hey, you know, you're going to die if we don't take you. Um, you know, you need to get your stomach pumped. You've consumed too much. And I declined. So they made me sign the release that they would not be responsible in the event of my demise. I was like, OK, I vaguely remember scribbling. They left. I locked up, went on upstairs. Um, so the turning point for me was being in the bed. Um, literally, um, if, if you could even imagine feeling the life, like leaving my body slowly, like I began to get cold, like cold sweat, um, lose my faculties, things of that nature. And I was like, oh crap, it's happening. Okay. So this is what this is. So now I'm scared. And, um, the last person I spoke to was my dad. And I said, you know, this is what I've done, this is blah, 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 whatever. So to end the story. Before I closed my eyes, I was like, Lord, forgive me. And I just went off to sleep. Well, the next morning, I woke up and I was like, okay, this don't look like where I'm supposed to be at. So it didn't work. Um, and that was the chaining, the turning point in my life because in my mind, you know, people may think differently, but in my mind, based on what I know about medicine, what I know from what the paramedics told me, what I know about what all I had done, there was no way I should have woken up the next morning. No way at all. So the fact that um, God graced me to, he saw in me what I couldn't see in myself to wake me up. That was the turning point for me to say, you know what? Let me get on up from here. And, you know, I might be skin and bones right now because I ain't ate in a while. But let me go get me a biscuit and try to eat some food and pick myself up because apparently I have purpose and me just sitting here isn't going to achieve it. Mm. So here I am. Right, right, great. I love it. And Katrina Motri, so you said that um, there was a problem and you wanted to solve it and you didn't know the information you needed to know at the time, but you knew to jump in and just gain that knowledge to not lose this opportunity. Can you speak to that just a little bit more? Because I think for us women to, um, that is huge. There's so much opportunity out there. And sometimes I think we feel it has to look exactly like we're told it should look, right? Instead of us being, you know, just intentional, the word we used earlier, and aggressive yeah. towards um, forging our path. So I just didn't want us to skim over that. If you can kind of go back and just speak to that a little bit more. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's basically, um, I was presented with um, a problem that needed to be solved. Um, and 
I have a background in Christianity. Um, my mom's a pastor. My dad was a pastor. So I was always taught, you know, when there is a problem, you're presented with the problem. A lot of times you're presented with that problem because God has already placed in you the solution for that mm-hmm. problem. So I kind of, I live by that. Uh, mm-hmm. If an opportunity comes, if I'm faced with a problem, um, anything, I, I'm, I, I just have something in me that wants to arise and, and solve that problem. So that's always been my outlook. Um, and, and I believe that when opportunity comes, that is quite often um, God or um, the universe telling us that there's something on the inside of you. There's some hidden talent. There's some unexposed ability. There is some dormant potential or some seeds that are laying on the inside of you that we are trying to extract. Um, so anytime there's an opportunity, um, the first thing that's going to come a lot of times is fear. That, that, mm-hmm. that thought in your yep. head, I, I can't do this. This is too big. Yes. I've never... I don't know anything about building a website. Right. I don't know how to code. This is so, this is what smart people do. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm not smart enough to figure out this computer language. Um, but when you move all of that aside and you take a deep breath and you say, hey, I can do this. I can do this. I can figure out how to do this. That's where that mm-hmm. strength is is going to come. That That's where those solutions are going to start pouring out. Um, and okay. I, I often say a lot of times that's how you find your purpose. A lot of people struggle with that question. What's my purpose? What's my purpose? I don't know what I'm here for. Mm-hmm. What are you convicted about? Usually the thing that you're convicted about is tied to that purpose. Yeah. Um, and again, um, when there's that problem or you know that opportunity, that's, you, that's the call for you to rise up, rise up to the challenge. Um, never be afraid um, because fear is always going to come knocking. Um, but fear isn't even a natural response for us as human beings. We Fear isn't encoded into our DNA. Um, so once you push that out of the way, push forward, P- push forward. I, I've always tried to be someone that says, hey, I don't have all the answers. And I'm not afraid to say I don't know or I don't have the answer, but guess what? I, I, I'm going to do my best to figure it out. And when, when you start trying to figure things out, you just begin to, to uncover. It's like layers and layers and layers. And mm-hmm. you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that existed. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that I, I could do that. So, um, and, and that's just how I am now. Like anything, I'm like, oh, let me try to figure it out. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, uh-huh. but you never yeah. know unless you try. You have mm-hmm. to try. So never stop trying. Never be afraid to do things that you have not done before. Never be afraid to think outside of the box. Um, never be afraid to come out of your comfort zone. Because typically right outside of your comfort zone, that's where success lies. And, and we're just, we're being stretched. We're being pulled. Um, so um, I, I think that, that that would be the message that I could give um, to anyone woman, man, child, um, just press in and never be afraid to, to, to answer that call when it comes to happen at your door. That's what I was about to just lastly ask, Harry, what was the message for all of us, all of us being women, different experiences and, uh, experience in different women, uh, what would be the thing for everyone? And I think, Katrina, you probably hit on that that you would share and pour amongst us women? What would be that thing? You know what I would tell people? Like if I had the platform where I could speak to the world, right? Like, I don't know how I would be there. You have it right (laughs) now. So yes, you you know what I would tell them? I have two outlooks on fear, all right? You can either forget everything and run or you can face everything and rise. Yes. That's, that's, those are my two definitions of fear. So you can forget your dreams, forget your aspirations, forget what it is that you know is in you to do, and you can run away and say, you know what, forget this, it's too hard, like Katrina said. Or you can face everything that comes in front of you 
and you can rise. It might not be easy. And to Katrina's point, you might not get it that first time. You might not get it the second time. Shoot, you might not get it at all. But you have risen to the challenge because you tried. And that's what I would tell you. Me, I'm facing everything and I'm rising with it. Come on, let's go. Here we I, go. This might be a little deep. <laughs> it might be a little deep. But let me throw this life jacket on. Mm-hmm. Because the thing about life jacket, um, and I'm going to share this and then I'm going to shut it up because I could talk all day long. Um, I went to um, uh, Jamaica last March. I had never been snorkeling. I cannot swim. I'm terrified of water. So we were on the the little cabin ran or whatever. Everybody was geared up, you know, got their little uh, scuba sea snorkel stuff on. I done got all dressed up. I'm terrified at this point. (laughs) So I'm letting people go past, go past, go past. And the guy's like, come on, man, come on, young man, jump in, man. I'm like, yeah. So I'm crying on the side. So finally he's like, you getting in or not? So I went to the edge and I looked down and I was like, this is some deep water, which really, you know, snorkeling ain't really that deep. So one of the young ladies that was this side, she said, Katrina, the life jacket is going to bring you back up. She said, all you got to do is jump and let the life jacket do the rest. It's going to keep you afloat. So I jumped in. I went down, but I was so focused on coming back up that I couldn't focus on the fact that I went down, I'm under the water. So what it showed me to other people, it was just snorkeling. But to me, it was a real time example on if you focus on what's above and not what's below, that you'll always rise to the top. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Always. Because that life jacket, it, like she said, it brought me right back up. So, well, first that's of all, you could face told. anything, uh, Miss Katrina Burris. I mean, you faced the ultimate and yeah. came back, right? There's nothing else to face. And hearing your story, you sharing that um, made my heart pound. I, just did an interview with a gentleman who also survived a suicide attempt. And there's so much similarity to what you said. Even he prepared three days over it. You attempted three days, but his preparation was three days. The third day was to blow the head off. And I would like for you all to look at that um, episode on Seek Elevation. And it came out timely because we are losing a lot of women to these situations. Um, Just a former uh, University of South Carolina track athlete. Um, exited out and there's a lot going on so just hearing your story was I was like wow there's a lot that we all need to learn and to know Um, we miss so much for people who actually transition and exit so thank you for sharing that story and Carmelita you what was your your message your thing what was my what your message or that thing you leave out to women that's what I was asking what is that um, I think the number one thing I'm always going to leave at, leave out, leave at is lead with your confidence. You know, you, you have to lead with your confidence. You have to be secure in everything that you want. Um, you have to be okay to fail. A lot of people mm-hmm. are terrified to fail and, and they don't push themselves because they don't want to fail. And everyone that's been great has failed over and over and over yes ma'am yes ma'am and so when you are when you stop being afraid to fail that's when you're truly going to elevate because nothing's going to phase you um the the fact that you know and i say this when i say for two world championships i kept getting a bronze medal in my eyes that was failing you know because i knew i should have won gold and so what, what I took from that was if I felt like I failed in front of millions, then I'm never going to be afraid of anything. Mm-hmm. And so I always tell people that it's okay to fail. And I wish, I hope you fail with people watching because, <laughs> then, because then you're invincible, right? You, yes. you, you know what oh it my feels God. like when everybody's looking at you like, oh, you didn't do it. But then you know what it feels like when everybody's looking at you and they, and they say, dang, she did it or he that did it. Powerful. So, that is powerful. So don't, be, don't be afraid to fail. Be okay with jumping. And you know what? Yeah. If you hit the ground, you hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
And, and yeah, if you hit the water and swallow a little bit, it's okay. Just spit it out. <laughs> you know, you know if, if you try to put that perm on yourself and burn your hair out, it's cool. Um, Do it again. No, it's all right. And so, so you you have to be you have to be okay with failing because there's no yeah. progress if you don't know what that feeling feels like. And maybe that's mm-hmm. why I'm a person that loves pressure because I failed at something. So because mm-hmm. I failed before. Pressure is a privilege. Pressure is a privilege. And we, we I'm learn, I'm, a, I'm gonna family. use that, but I'm gonna I'm <laughs> quote you though, Carmelita. <laughs> yeah. And we learn in it. So I, I agree. And I think for me to add to all of what you're all saying for our women, um, from my personal experience on the different journeys that I have taken, especially in male dominated industries. And a lot of people look like, how are you even doing this in entertainment and in sports on this side against um you know, those who are supposed to be dominating. The one thing I've learned and I would like to share is don't attach yourself to any narrative that will allow you to narrow who you are. And so this is going to sound like you said earlier, uh, Dr. Katrina, unorthodox or unconventional. Don't attach yourself to your inferior, but don't attach yourself to your superwoman. You, You... any of those can force you when you latch on to an identity, force you to have to just be stuck in that. Don't attach mm-hmm. yourself to um, independent and interdependent. Don't attach yourself to I'm just strength and I'm not vulnerable. It depends on mm-hmm. how you move. You have yes. to attach yourself to the fact that we are living energies created in these human bodies with this physical anatomy to mm-hmm. do something unique. That's the only yes. thing to attach to. Everything else can change. And when I learned to detach from that stuff, I mm-hmm. learned in how I'm moving, I can be the strength when I need to be it. I could be vulnerable mm-hmm. when I need to be it. I could be That's independent right. when I need to be it. I could be interdependent when I need to be it. And yes. all those things, because I didn't attach, allow me to just kick down doors, recreate, build doors, build my own tables and do all that stuff. So that's why I want us mm. to, my message to us women, because we are, that's put on our shoulder to find a narrative to attach to and just stand in it. And sometimes it feel like we're in a movement when we do it, but that is, mm-hmm. that's trickery. Don't yes. attach to any of that and just know that I am this person, this, this living energy that's here to offer something unique to this world. And that's it. Yay. Uh, I want to thank all of you. I want to give you this opportunity. We're going to wrap it up here, but I want each of you to give, uh, there's going to be some people out here who want to reach out to you uh, from your platform. So if you would please just state your platform to where if anybody wants to reach out, be, uh, be mentored uh, from you, uh, take in some more uh, creative things, or even uh, let them know what you're doing and stuff like that can, uh, so they can get in contact and try to be a part of what you're doing. Um, so I want to start with uh, Coach Jetta, uh, given your platform. Well, you can reach out to me at um, Carmelita Jetta 1979 at gmail.com. So it's my first, my last name, the year I was born, <laughs> 1979 at gmail.com. And, you know, my platform is simply just empowering young women and young men to to reach for the stars, to set their goals, to, to be dominant in everything that they, they set out to do. Um, and it's just not about me coaching on the track. It's me coaching in life. You know, I'm a person that athletes are around more than they are around their parents. So my job is a little bigger and a little thicker than just putting some cones down and telling someone to run when I blow a whistle. Um, my job is to prepare you for when you leave me. Yes. All right. The um, I can be reached um at I guess I'll just give my, my web address. Um it is relight. Um uh, relight is spelled R-E-L-Y-T. It's just Tyler spelled backwards. Um Relight Media Group at gmail.com. Um, there you'll find all of my contact information, um, telephone numbers, email addresses, um, things of that sort. Let's get Trina Burris. 
So you can follow me on social media, on IG, um, my platform for my women's empowerment brand, and also my new nonprofit is at Katrina Chanel 2. Um, I'm looking for models for my makeup, some people that let me use their beautiful faces as canvases. Um, if you love makeup or just want to learn about skincare, I'm a big advocate for skincare because skincare is a large part of makeup. Um, you can follow me at the Highlight Boss, as in B A W S E. And if you want to email me, you can email me at Katrina Chanel, the number two, at gmail.com. I'm about to follow you right now. <laughs> so Thank you. Said, highlight, highlight Boss. Yes, girl, the Highlight Boss. So the highlight, like hair highlights, and then boss, B A W A W S E. Oh, there you go. It's all one word. <laughs> Okay, there I, you go. I just followed you, Katrina. And thank Ms. you, Ella Keisha O'Kelly. Yes, to keep my simple because there's so many things. Like I said, I'm doing um, so many platforms. You can go to All About Ella because literally everything is all about me. Allaboutella.com. Um, if you want to connect on any um, social media platforms or just to keep up with um, what I have going on, any books, anything that's out, you can go to the website. What was really near and dear to my heart right now is, like I just mentioned earlier, um, with my Empower cast, I took it to another level to video content. And I took it to that level because I was nudged. I was nudged from my clients and this, those around me because we have deep conversations. Again, the tag is I'm an attorney. But when I sit down with individuals, we go deeper. We go deeper because I want to really level you up, especially our community. And they said, you know what? you should bring these conversations that we're having because you're very knowledgeable on this level and we're bringing these certain questions, bring them to the public. And so now with Seek Elevation, I jumped in on video content. Uh, content. So if you go to YouTube, newly using it, and I just did an interview, like I just said with Miss Katrina, just with an NFL player about um, a very, very, heartfelt story, but it's going to be 25 more to come every two weeks that I think is going to shift our community. So if you will please connect on YouTube with Seek, and that's Elevation as in E-L-L-A, like my name, E-L-L-A-Vation, Seek Elevation. I love it. Well, I thank you all for joining us, uh, joining me today. Uh, I think this was very much needed and wanted out there. Um, again, just keep following me. Um, T Price Experience, new show coming uh, is in the works. Um, but this was the women of leadership and ownership. Thank you all for watching. Peace. <laughs>